Okay, so hello, happy Friday, and welcome to Beginning with Bees, Frequently Asked Questions, number 13. And today is Friday, April 19th. So maybe you've got Easter plans coming up this weekend. Maybe you're on spring break. If you are, thank you for spending your valuable time on break uh, watching this video and thinking about honeybees and how to get started. This whole series is geared towards people that are beginning with bees. So those who you know don't have a lot of years of beekeeping experience under their belt, Maybe you don't have them yet. Maybe you can't keep bees at all wherever you live and it's just out of general curiosity. Thanks for showing up. Uh, everyone is welcome to post questions here. And if you'd like to, put your questions down in the comments section below the video. If you wanna know what we're gonna talk about in this video sequence, uh, look down in the video description and I'll line item everything that we talk about in this video. So you won't waste your time because I don't want you hoping that I cover some subject that doesn't get touched upon. And uh, that's the way it goes. If you've been here for 13 episodes, thank you. That just means that uh, maybe you're getting something out of it, and I hope you are. And uh, I look forward to hearing from you in the comments section, and we're going to jump right in. Um, I'm not even going to talk about the weather because later in my frequently asked questions, somebody actually asks about it. So that's when I'll address it, and I'm going to throw in some video sequences that should be interesting. So let's kick it right off here. Larry Lee, first question. What are your thoughts on the single brood box method with the queen excluder and then multiple honey boxes? Okay, for those of you that are new, when we put together a beehive, we have the uh, bottom box, You've got uh, which is normally deep, and that's because it handles deep frames. So <coughs> this is an example of a deep frame. And of course this is empty, this is foundationless and it's made out of wood and this is one of the frames that comes from the Flow Hive company. So you have a top bar and so on. When we put bees in the bottom box, uh, I do this frequently in my own apiary. So if you've looked at videos of my beehives and I hope you do, I hope that pretty soon I can get outside. Today it's pouring rain of course. Again, I mean why wouldn't it be? Uh, we had the worst weather ever this year. Anyway, so uh, a lot of my beehives are at least one deep box. And a deep box just means that it handles these deep frames. And then there are medium frames and shallow frames. And so the boxes are either deep, medium, or shallow. And the reason for that is uh, the bottom box is generally reserved for brood and the resources immediately for rearing brood. And that would include honey, and the pollen that they've brought in, and the nurse bees are there, and the queen occupies that box. And uh, the queen can migrate up, but uh, normally the higher frames and higher boxes are reserved for nothing but food in the form of honey. So when they store honey, that's why we call them supers. They have a supervisor, that's something that's over someone else. Superordinate, for example, anytime super is attached to uh, a honeybee piece of equipment, then that means it's above. So honey supers are above other boxes. Now, the reason that people use medium boxes and shallow boxes is just because they're lighter and easier to manage and lift and move around. So my practice is to have a bottom board, a deep brood box, whether that's eight frame or 10 frame, and then I'll have either a medium super going up from there, and then we keep adding those as the bees fill those uh, spaces and draw out comb. Drawing out comb just means that the bees are creating cells out of wax and by drawing it out, they're just making them deeper until they are full depth, whatever that might be. And that's dictated by the frame spacing that you have inside your boxes, how deep their cells are going to be and how much they draw out the comb with wax. So I have at least one and then a medium and that's all for the bees. So when I put on a flow super, for example, or any kind of super that I'm gonna take the honey off later, that's above and beyond at least the bottom two boxes. Now the question is about a single brood box method with a queen excluder. I don't, uh, I recommend that beginners use queen excluders because that means a queen excluder is nothing but a um, grid that is too tight for the queen herself to get through. So only the workers can go through it and they get up into the honey area. And that means you don't have eggs, you don't have brood, you don't have anything in your honey super except honey. 
uh, I don't use the queen excluder. So what I do is I put the brood box down first and we're gonna go over that coming up this year. I'm gonna show you how to set up a hive step-by-step step, and we're gonna install package bees and I'm going to explain the progression of a colony of bees as they build. So these are, these are just the basics here that we're talking about in theory. So I don't put the queen excluder on. I let them build out that bottom box first. And then as the population builds, then I put a medium super on top of that without a queen excluder, because I don't care who goes up in there. I'm not taking the honey off. So it's all for the bees. So then they will continue to expand their comb area and the bees will you know, use beeswax and they'll draw out comb cells and then they'll store honey in there. Then above that, once I see through inspection, a solid band of nothing but honey, I don't need a queen excluder. And beyond that, that's honey that I may draw off later. So as far as the uh, single deep method, I use that. And then sometimes I have a double deep, but there's no huge advantage between the two. I just happen to have those boxes and deep frames. So then you put the medium boxes on and those are easier to manage. By the way, when you're taking those boxes off, you know, instead of lifting them straight up after you've run your hive tool in around the edges to pry it away, uh, I always give those boxes a little bit of a twist side to side and try to do that on a hot day. So when you pull the boxes open, uh, you won't be pulling the frames up from the box underneath with it or damaging the queen could be somewhere. Uh, tearing apart a bunch of cells, you're going to do a lot of damage every time you open your hive because they're bridging those frames. But uh, I don't use the queen excluder, so there's my answer there. If you were doing it and you're new and you want to make sure that the queen doesn't leave your brood box, then you put the queen excluder over that, then you put the medium super over that. So medium or deep is a matter of personal preference. The bees seem to use them equally. Although when it comes to the brood box, a deep is a good idea, just my opinion, because uh, that pattern of brood, that size of a deep frame seems to be just right. And then they expand to adjacent frames rather than expanding the brood chamber up higher. And they will you know, go up higher to get resources and come right down and feed the bees that are keeping the brood warm and humidified. So that's what I do, but again, Watch for it this summer or this spring, hopefully. You know, I really, what I've learned is if I tell someone I'm doing something next week, it doesn't happen because Lord knows we could get a hailstorm out of the blue. Like that could ever happen. And it did. So I just, I can't say when it's going to happen, but when I set up, you know, a beehive with a package, we're going to talk about this and we're going to follow that hive's growth and development through the summer and right into fall. So we're going to pick out one in particular and I'm going to show you this method and we are going to use a, a single deep and then we're going to do medium supers above that. So thank you for that question, Larry. And the next one is from St. Germain. What about record keeping? Some keepers write on the covers, uh, what kinds of information are noted and uh, hive scales, interior temp, humidity sensors, recommendations. Okay. I personally don't use any of the electronics, uh, to monitor interior conditions of a beehive. I also don't, uh, there's something called a brood minder, and uh, I'll put a link to that up in the video description if you want to check it out. I think those things are very expensive. The brood minder will tell you what the weight of your hive is, and uh, the sensor goes in so that you know the temperature. I don't know that it reads humidity. It also feeds the information to your phone, so you can stand in front of a hive, and you can identify that hive with a quick picture. And uh, this is part of your record keeping. You know, you take a, a digital picture of each hive, and then you assign that an identifier. You can, you know, uh, based on hive numbers, or you can have some geometric thing. If all of your hives physically look identical, if you have a whole row of nothing but white beehives and there's no distinguishing factor to those hives, then you're gonna have to come up with a serializing method. Um, and then you're gonna document your stuff. But if you have, you know, you can use your cell phone and uh, type in your notes right on your cell phone. I don't own a cell phone at all. So I can't use that. So I use uh, paper and folders and I walk around. What kinds of things do I document there? Uh, by the way, just, just to get back to the brood minder, if I were recording those details, the brood minder is set up so it saves everything with it. Plus, uh, I think there's also a kind of crowdsourcing of information there. If you have the brood minder where you uplink all your data 
and then other beekeepers in your zone in your area can see what your bees are doing as well so when they're taking on nectar when they're you know they're building honey and when the, the physical weight and the number of bees increases you're going to know that and those are important things to graph so that you know seasonally uh, when your beehives strengthen and then you can document that digitally i think a lot of people are just monitoring everything on their phones computers i don't know if anybody uses a blackberry anymore but uh, for me i just write it all down on paper so what kinds of things will i write down and also because i don't use a brood minder i don't know the the weight of the hive I do it old school. I just grab it. Ooh, it feels really heavy. They're building up. <laughs> so uh, I don't need a, a piece of electronics to tell me that, whoa, this hive's heavy, this hive's light. I also, if it's a really big one, I just push it a little bit and see if I can tip it. And uh, the heavy loaded hives don't tip very easy. And the lightweight ones that are not doing so well, bees have physical weight. And of course, their honey and resources can be very heavy. You can have 70 pounds in uh, one deep box. So uh, the brood minder is one method to do that. And the other thing that you want to keep a record of is uh, you may just be starting with one or two hives, three or four, five or six, it may expand. So for me, my max is 10. That's my goal. Although this year, apparently I might exceed that. But when I exceed 10, I like to give away my beehives with bees in them uh, to people that are starting out. And if you're watching right now and you're one of the people that are getting beehives from me, uh, they're not my top performing bees. I don't give away my best bees. I give away the bees that are okay. And equipment that I'm ready to get rid of because I'm rotating in brand new stuff, which we'll touch on later. But, um, so things to write down when you buy your bees. So you want to keep in your folder when you purchased a package of bees or a nuke, or if you caught a swarm, what were the conditions? Those things that are interesting too. Where was that swarm found? How high were they off the ground? Uh, were they on a tree? Were they on a fence post? Were they exposed? Physical weight of the swarm. Now here's what I like to do. I like to um, take a butterfly net, a big professional butterfly net, and I shake the swarm into that. And then I can physically document the weight of the swarm of bees. So I can say I got five pounds of bees there, six pounds of bees, three pounds of bees. So that's helpful. How big was the swarm? And uh, again, the parameters. How hot was the day? Did it just rain? When did that swarm arrive? Did it use one of your swarm traps? Okay. Okay, so quick interruption there was speedy delivery, FedEx there, dropping off replacement parts for my car that was sitting in the driveway when we had a hailstorm and it destroyed my mirrors and things like that. So I'm doing those myself, I'm gonna put those in. Anyway, um, so things to write down. If you've got queens that you bought in, for example, Obviously, keep very good records of your genetic stock, who you bought them from, what the shipping experience is like, was like, uh, obviously what boxes you put them in. How do you identify the boxes? You can just do a layout of your bee yard. Uh, unless you've got hundreds of hives, which I hope, if you do, you're not watching this. So I'm thinking the people that are watching this have just a handful of hives in their backyard. And... Uh, you want to just just be as thorough as you want to be. What are the bees doing? When you do an inspection, uh, document what you see. These guys are great at, you know, building honeycomb. These are fantastic at getting, you know, honey in and resources from the environment. Right now, in the opening, we had some of this uh, Salix discolor here. The plants like these willows are loaded with pollen right now. So here we are, April 19th willow pollen very strong resource so you can write down a lot of notes about what's going on so year by year it will help you to plan and also you're going to grade the performance of the bees that you're getting a lot of new beekeepers like to get uh, queens from different stocks the you know, corneolans they like to get italians they might get those uh, saskatras bees this year so you're going to want to write down who the seller was how they arrived what their condition was you know 50% of the package was dead, 20% was dead, they did really well. And if they were dead or, you know, if their numbers were reduced, what were the weather extremes in the path, you know, from the shipper to you? So what was going on when you got them? When you installed them, how well did they do? And so you'll make comparisons and ultimately you'll pick bees based on your records um, that will show how well they did in your area and how well they took advantage of the resources available in the environment in which you live. So records are very important. How old is your hive equipment? 
You'll notice that some people, when they open up, especially when they've got the wooden uh, frames on there, and if they don't have wooden frames, if you've got those acorn plastic frames, for example, you can use markers, uh, gel pens, and things like that, and you can mark right on the back the date that you installed that. So then you'll know. I rotate out uh, half of my frames every year, so it's like every other frame. I don't do an all-in and all-out kind of thing. So part of your record keeping would be when you got new frames, when you put them in. This year I'm experimenting with the Man Lake pre-waxed frames and then of course the Acorn frames. And I've stopped using Pierco. So between those two, how well did the bees use them? Did they take to them equally? Did they like others better? Did some of those frames seem to flex or did, were there problems? So material condition documentation is also important. How well did your hives hold up? What kind of finish did you put on it? Did you glue them together? Did you just use nails or screws? It's as detailed as you want it to be, but let me tell you one thing that does not exist right now. At least I couldn't find it. Uh, there needs to be a beekeeper calendar and uh, nobody's putting one out. It seems obvious to me. A beekeeper calendar, in my opinion, is not... Uh, a calendar that just has pictures of bees for every month and things like that. A beekeeping calendar, digital or printed, and if they make one uh, in a book form, a beekeeping calendar that includes beekeeping best practices that are seasonal, somebody, that's going to sell. Uh, if you know somebody that makes one right now, go ahead and put a link down in the video uh, comment section because I allow links, unless it's somebody that's just promoting their stuff that has nothing to do with what we're doing here. Those are automatically blocked. If you post a link, don't be frustrated. It goes to auto spam until I release it. So if you know of someone that's got a really nice spiral bound or you know three ring notebook style B calendar, that, and it should be regional. So the Northeast would have one, the Northwest would have one. The uh, you know middle and southern districts would have another, or it could be by agricultural zones. But regional beekeeping calendars would be critical because it would describe uh, preparations for the new beekeeper and leave a place. The way these are done, when I have my sheets, you know we have the line items and then we have open spaces for little sketches and things, and then uh, places for your notes. So if somebody published a bee calendar that left space for notes that had ticklers that said you know, treat before putting honey supers on and things like that. And then that will give you a place to keep a record. When you are treating your bees, you need to document very carefully exactly what you were treating them with and when you did it and what the response was to the bees. Was there a die off? Was it effective? Was it not? What did you pay for it? Where did you source it? So keeping records is, is very important. I have piles of spiral notebooks, but if somebody published a, uh, spiral notebook and made that available in a region, region by region, you know, um, ticklers for beginning beekeepers. I'm sure, you know, beginning beekeeper books have things like that, what to do seasonally, but a calendar format would be extremely valuable. And also on that, you know what should be in the front cover of your beekeeping record book? Your Department of Agriculture Extension Office, the Extension Office number, your Game Commission, and the game commission phone number because if you get you know if your hive gets destroyed by bears or something the game commission is your friend you need to let them know what's going on and that these things are unafraid of buildings and things like that so this is all a part of very important record keeping so i would say in the in the opening cover of your book all of your source information emergency information uh and uh, just and there might even be a list of things that you need to have available. So like a checklist that would be in your records also. Swarm kit, what needs to be in it? You know, a swarm box, I need to have uh, gloves, I need to have, you know, sugar water sprayer or something like that. So having lists built into your record keeping system, I think would be very valuable. So if you know about uh, somebody who's already making these calendars, put a link down in the comment section and, and We'll check that out. And if there isn't one, I wish one of you would get out there, somebody with publishing skills, and put one together, a meaningful book, partner up with an expert in beekeeping, and uh, release regional beekeeping logs that uh, people physically write in. I don't like the digital logs. People like me just wouldn't get the digital version. It wouldn't work unless they're, you, know, you print out the sheets yourself, which again, I don't like. I'd like to get a nice 
weatherproof cover so that we can uh, write those things in. So I think that's, a, also there would be a space in your binder to keep your uh, apiary registration paperwork, your permit number, things like that, everything in one space. That's a great question, St. Germain. Thank you. So uh, yeah, some people just write on the covers, write on the frames and things like that, but I think it'd be great to have, I'm not a big fan of sensors, obviously, but uh, other than thermal cameras to see what's going on on the outside, but putting sensors and stuff inside your hives just does not you know, appeal to me at all. Uh, physical weight measuring devices, again, very limited uh, application there in my opinion. Plus that information is already available. People that do have those things, you can just log in and see what their information is. But uh, keep as detailed records as you possibly can because that's gonna help you season by season. You're gonna start to see trends and you're gonna be able to adopt best practices for your area in beekeeping. Okay, uh, someone named Adrian here wrote, what do I do if it starts to rain? Will the bees be okay? The bees handle everything on their own. When like recently we had this uh, dramatic storm that came in really fast. We went from really warm weather to high wind conditions, uh, big hail. The hail was up to two inches in diameter. It's pretty incredible. And uh, so the, the bees were flying because I was actually out in the bee yard. And when uh, I heard that a storm might come through, I was out there strapping down beehives and making sure everything was gonna be secure so that we could handle, they were forecasting 70 mile an hour winds and a potential hail. So when you, ah, oh, potential hail, okay. So you think little beads of hail might come. Uh, that's what I was doing when uh, I started to see rotation activity in the sky. And so what did I do? You know, I'm a videographer, I'm a photographer. I grab my gear and run out there to, to photograph the dramatic weather situation, not knowing that I was directly in the path. So we're gonna show that later on. But um, what do the bees do? Bees that are out foraging, stay out. They don't make it back. When there's sudden cloud cover, sudden you know cloud burst and rain comes pouring down, the bees that are foraging, they're out and about, they seek shelter on their own. So they get under leaves and things, they cling there. You can find them when you go out and about early in the mornings when it's still cool, before it warms up, you can see uh, little bees that are just out stuck. You know, they're still alive, they're barely moving. And uh, as things warm up, they will find their way back to their hive. So the bees that are out in the thousands, especially, you know, when it happens mid afternoon like that, uh, bees that are out and about, just they hunker down where they are, they take the storm, and those that survive just fly back to the colony when it clears up. If it doesn't clear up before nightfall, they spend the night out in and on trees and things like that, and then they come back the following day. So uh, there's really nothing you can do for that. So other than worry, if you want to, but the bees that are out, you see it all the time. They get hit with a sudden storm. The things I think about is when there are you get a swarm call and somebody has a swarm of bees in their yard and you're thinking, wow, it's like 39 degrees outside and it's been raining for two days. How are they even surviving? Well, they are in you know survival mode. They are trying to just make it. And you go there and there's a cluster of bees all covered in water. And of course the queen is in the middle and uh, they're in jeopardy. They're totally in jeopardy. Very few swarms of bees that are not collected by beekeepers, very few of those make it. Most of them just, uh, eventually die out or they try to make comb right where they are. And if you're in the Northeastern United States, they don't have very good chances. So that's what they do. They just hunker down and try to get through it. There's nothing you can do to uh, support your bees other than make sure that they have uh, hives to go into that are, that are weatherproof, that are very well built. And uh, once they make it to the hive that they are protected there. So, um, then uh, someone from, it's called, I think it's Snarky Dink Farm or Sharky Dink Farm. Eh, my own writing here isn't that good. Do you have any thoughts or experience with horizontal hives? So horizontal hives, I think he wrote, uh, he or she wrote AZ hives or HZ hives. Uh, these are horizontal hives. I don't have any. I don't have any experience with them. I have friends who years ago got into top bar hives. That's a horizontal format. Uh, most people will say that, you know, we, the hive designs that we use now and stacking the boxes up 
is supposed to imitate, you know, a hollowed out tree that's, of course, vertical. Uh, it's also reasonable, though, that bees do make comb laterally. Uh, if a tree fell, for example, and was, you know, dead in the woods and was hollowed out in the middle, uh, it would be reasonable that uh, a swarm of bees would occupy it and that it would become a beehive tree. Of course, it's on the ground and, you know, skunks and other things could get right into it. It wouldn't be optimal. But bees certainly do build horizontally. But why would anybody want to do that? Uh, primarily because there are people that are getting into beekeeping in retirement. There are older people, there are people that can't lift all those boxes. So the thinking is that if you run a big horizontal hive, first of all, it's a static hive. It's, you don't pull the boxes off so they can be really thick. You could build a horizontal hive out of plank material. So the other thing is there are top bar hives. Again, um, I'm just describing basically why it appeals to people, and that's because they don't have to lift boxes. Instead, you're pulling individual frames, and the colony, instead of expanding vertically, expands horizontally, and you pull the frames out. So my thoughts are, if you want to try that out, try it out. I did send messages out to Beekeeping Association members. I uh, kind of shotgunned questions out to people. Is anybody keeping a horizontal hive? The horizontal hive and the top bar hive, they're both horizontal formats, but a top bar hive only has the top bar that the bees draw their comb down on. And there are horizontal hives that are full Langstroth style boxes that are just extended widthwise so that you have more of the normal frames going out in each direction. And then they use queen excluders just as you would vertically, but they do it horizontally. And then they have solid boards that block it until they fill the space. So instead of adding boxes, you're just removing your blocker and adding frames horizontally. And the thing of it is, I have a friend that uh, when I was teaching a series at the Whole Foods Co-op about honeybees years ago, he was going up to Vermont and attending a lot of uh, you know bee seminars and presentations and things like that. And he came back and he set up a big uh, top bar beehive right away. And he had several other beehives in his apiary. He never got it to take. Uh, the bees that he started in there swarmed out and swarmed out. The difference between swarming out and absconding, if they abscond, they basically they all just leave. And that's what happened to him. There were a couple of swarms and then ultimately the entire colony just evacuated his uh, top bar hive. So I don't know if it doesn't work very well in the north. He learned about it in Vermont. So, I mean, somebody's doing something up there where it apparently worked. I don't have direct experience with it. And then the first thing I thought was, you know, maybe I'll just get one and uh, try it out. But then I thought, I don't know if I really want to just set up a horizontal hive. It doesn't appeal to me personally. So there again, the advantages would be it's a horizontal format. It can be physically strong. Uh, physically thick and well insulated. You don't take it apart. Uh, you pull the top cover off and you work frame by frame. So people that can't lift much uh, could certainly benefit from something like a top bar hive or a horizontal Langstroth design uh, where you have full frames that, you, again, you pull out, service, and inspect. Because a frame can weigh 10 or 12 pounds when it's full of honey and it's a deep frame. So if you uh, are, are pulling frames, that's much easier. And I see that appeal. Also, you could have it at a convenient height for someone. If you're in a wheelchair, for example, uh, you would have that at a, it could be the height of this table. So somebody could come up to this in a wheelchair and uh, be able to work bees and interact with them and do all the things that beekeepers do with normal boxes. So I see that as a huge advantage for people that uh, have you know physical disabilities that restrict their uh, mobility, physical strength is reduced, and things like that. So that's the target group, I think, for those styles of beehives. And uh, again, my plan, if somebody responds to me locally, and uh, I sent that email out again this morning, if somebody has one and it's working, I'm just going to do a field report. We're going to go out there and we're going to talk to them, hoping that they're that they're open to a visit and that they don't mind uh, having their operations shown. There are a lot of beekeepers that, you know, barely want to talk about their stuff, let alone want you in their bee yard uh, videoing and sharing what they do and how they do it. Very private people uh, that are often extremely successful, but don't even want, they guard their secrets. They don't want you to know. So, <clears throat> <clears throat> uh, 
And this is also where I'm gonna kind of put it out to you. If you know someone in a northern climate where they have nice cold winters uh, that is using a horizontal hive setup, or if, it, if you're using one and you've got a top bar, top bar hive that's working really well, please put those links uh, down in the uh, comment section of this video and that way other people can check that out. I'm more than happy to say I don't have direct uh, personal experience with it. I don't know if I will. At uh, the very best, I will go somewhere where someone has one that appears to be succeeding. Uh, as I mentioned before, those I know who have had them in the past have had no luck with them. Uh, it was in comparison to the vertical box uh, Langstroth designs, uh, they just did not function well and uh, people sell them off or give them away very inexpensively. So it's kind of hard to give you a solid answer you know but I'm, I'm happy to say when i don't know something and i really don't know why they work or don't uh, but i can understand the appeal and why people hope that they would work <clears throat> the other question here is best glue for bee boxes again this was fun for me because hopefully during winter you're putting together bee boxes for me i've been out in my workshop it's not heated so you have options when you're putting your bee boxes together. Usually they have the box joints on them, the finger joints, box joints, box joints. Uh, and then you're putting them together with stainless steel screws or some people are using nails. And I like to uh, screw and glue them together. And normally I've been using Gorilla Glue, Gorilla Wood Glue specifically. But uh, this year I'm using Tight Bond. This is Tight Bond Premium wood glue here. These are water-based glues that are really good. Uh, and there's Premium and Ultimate, two and three. This one's water-resistant, interior, exterior. Your beehives are exterior, so you're gonna wanna glue the joints up with something that's good like that. This one is waterproof. Waterproof, water-resistant, waterproof. So waterproof, exterior, interior, longer assembly time and water cleanup. So the reason I like to use this is it's not just a longer assembly time that I like because uh, I don't know if you've seen any of my bee box assembly videos. I have special uh, corner braces and things like that to keep perfect 90s. And uh, when you clamp these all up together, if you're not using screws at all, you set it up as a perfect 90 and you set it off to the side. This uh, Type on 3 works in lower temperatures. I was gluing stuff up in 39, 40 degree temperatures. A lot of glues don't work. A lot of glues will say minimum temperature, 60 degrees and things like that. So the Type Bond 3 waterproof, I like the idea that's waterproof. So your boxes are gonna get rained on and everything else. And then you're gonna put a, a you know coating on it afterwards. The longer working time lets you glue up all four corners and you know those uh, box joints are already pretty rigid. The fits are already pretty snug. And then when you clamp them up, you have time to square it up, check the corners, the diagonals to make sure that your boxes are perfectly square. Then just set them off and put each corner over a piece of uh, wax paper and let it sit there. And it'll set up perfect without screws or nails. And it'll be just as strong as the wood that it's bonded to. So in the past, I was using Gorilla Wood Glue uh, this year, it's Type Bond 2 and Type Bond 3. Type Bond 3, longer working time, lower working temperatures, and a waterproof joint. So for me, Type Bond 3 right now. And that's why I like it. Like, for example, this dive watch right here, water resistant. They don't even say waterproof on that, and it's good for 150 meters. Uh, the alarm goes off at 90 meters, because I don't want to do a recomp you know, decompression dive. But uh, even that's not listed as waterproof. That's water resistant. This stuff, waterproof. I don't know if you can make a boat out of it or anything, but I just like the idea that that's the most weatherproof one you can get. So here we go. Next question. Mimi, I burned a hole in my bee suit veil. Can I buy some mesh and fix it? It's about the size of a quarter. Okay, that, you know, that caused me to think about it a little bit. A lot of people probably have put holes in their veils. You know, I never have. Uh, I think some people burn their veil when they're lighting their smoker, and uh, most people have learned to put their veil behind them. This is not a criticism. But then I thought, uh, if you burn a hole in the veil, um, 
what could you replace that with? And then I thought, wow, why don't we just put a clear insert in there and then put holes around that and then stitch the remaining veil to the hole. Now we have a clear see-through. Well, the veil does a lot of things. Uh, the way it is, it's designed to reduce the contrast between your eyes and other parts of your face, for example. So veils are often white fabric or they're black fabric. Sometimes they're wire, they're, you know, a screen material. So the other thing is, I put these ball caps out here today because people uh, send me ball caps for free with my shipments of stuff. But we, two of these are um, be suit companies. I think this one is natural apiary, which makes the maximum protection suit that I wear. And then these guys over here, Guardian Be Apparel. Guardian Be Apparel, but by the way, they didn't, you know, ask me to name them or anything like that. It's completely on me. I don't wear a lot of ball caps, so I thought I'd just show them off here. But Guardian Bee Apparel has a veil that unzips and opens up. So you can drink coffee or, you know, drink a lot of water, for example. I guess the thinking there was because people have veils and stuff on, they, they have no holes to sip through it or to hydrate. So the guy that invented their suits actually dehydrated and suffered a partial heat stroke or something like that, heat exhaustion. And so it came up with ventilated suits that allowed you to zip them open. Now, when you've got a hole in your veil, it's opportunity, you just stitch it shut. You could put another piece of material over that, but now you're creating a contrast area. And I thought, you know, by putting a clear piece in front, I'd be able to see better, for example. Um, but then when you do that, you reveal that you have contrasting areas and the bees would be interested in that. So I just suggest getting a new veil, but, uh, yeah, you'd want to match up the material and just stitch it up. You could, you could do that. So, but I guess the main thing is just be careful about your veils. I have a lot of hats that just have veils that hang down. And if they had a hole in it, I would just stitch that hole shut completely with fish line or something. But, uh, it is interesting. Uh, but it caused me to think a little bit about different veils that are available and if I've ever damaged one and I really haven't, but you need to very carefully inspect those veils because you don't want a, a hole in it that you didn't know about. And of course the bees get in, but, uh, and I think she did ultimately, uh, fix the veil and, but you know, they're made out of such a range of materials. Some of it is very thin, like mosquito netting. Some of it actually feels like wire and it's thick so you could use window screen you could get pieces of uh, fabric window screen there's fiberglass window screen uh, and then of course there's aluminum window screen so you could cut a patch and then just uh, stitch that on or i don't know hot glue it i'm not a, a veil repair person but a small hole like that you have lots of options i would fool around and you know stick something clear in there and it leads me down the path of thinking of all kinds of veil modifications that might be fun but that's also why i had the tie-in of the guardian bee apparel with a veil that zips open and uh very well made by the way and of course uh natural apiary for the protection when i go into hornets and wasps and things like that so to buy mesh, I don't. I would say don't throw away old veils. Keep them and keep the materials uh, handy so you could use it for other things. I save old window screen and everything. Okay, um, Spirit Bear. Uh, this question was asked today. Spirit Bear Twelve, I think, is the full name. Why don't you want bees to rob a failed hive? In uh, one of my other videos recently, I said that. Uh, we need to close up hives that we think uh, are dead because we don't want bees robbing them out. So I don't want bees just going in and robbing out empty hives. So when you have a beehive in your apiary, and I had a few die out this year. So when you have that, you need to block up the entrance to it. We don't want wax moths to take it over, but we also, I also don't want the bees going in and robbing out the resources that are still in there. One of them, for example, has a lot of honey still on it. And uh, I don't want the bees to just go in and get that until they've had a chance to inspect the hive. You need to do an autopsy on the hive and you need to take it all apart. And you need to look at the empty brood cells. You need to do a very careful inspection of everything and uh, make sure that you wouldn't be transmitting 
some disease as basic as nosema. You could have something uh, as terrible as American fowl brood or something like that. So you need to really figure out when your bees die. Uh, look for obvious things. You know, is it full of chalk brood, for example? We want to get those frames out of there. You know, it's your bees crawling all over chalk brood. Uh, if there's fowl brood, you got a big problem. You have to isolate everything in that hive. In fact, me personally, I'm going to report that to the Department of Agriculture. They're going to come out, they're going to do an inspection, they're going to take samples, and uh, we're going to see that little ropey substance in there. If it is American fowl brood, I've never had it. I've never had European fowl brood. But if you did, you need to know those things before you make those resources available to your bees. I'm not against the bees using the resources from a die, die out. Uh, in fact, I have a robbing station. I've referred to that many times in other videos. I have a robbing station that is to the west of my apiary. And uh, once I take apart the hive boxes and once I've inspected everything, then I do have open bottom boxes. So I take the landing board away and I have old frames. The blue ones that are in my videos from 2008, for example, I'm using in robbing stations. So I'll pull all the frames out and uh, those that are in good shape go right into the robbing station and that's where I let the bees clean those up for me. And then I have drawn comb that's completely empty. Nothing cleans up things like bees. And uh, then I can use those uh, back into other colonies. I can use them in swarm traps and things like that. So I'm not against the bees using the resources. I just caution people that when your bees have died until you've had a chance to determine uh, what's going on or what happened to that colony and you can do an inspection. Don't allow bees in there to rob it out. So I, I highly recommend closing it up. And then when I put it in the robbing station, we have open bottom boxes. We do have covers on to prevent, you know, rain and stuff from getting in. But by having an open bottom and a well ventilated space, the bees access through the open bottom of the boxes. Uh, they get the resources out and also wax moths don't move in and take over because uh, wax worms do not like to be exposed. The wax moths try to lay eggs and, and get their little wax worms started in hives that are protected and closed off and generally uh, sealed bottom, top, and sides from the weather. So by opening the bottom, we create a feeding station, a slant robbing station, and uh, that's what I like to do. But not until I've inspected to make sure that we're not just spreading some kind of uh, huge disease uh, situation. If you've got a bunch of small hive beetles or something in there, again, that hasn't happened to me yet, but it could. You have a colony that uh, the bees died out. We don't want to spread that. So those would go right in the fire. So if I found an infestation of small hive beetle, they would go right in the fire. I wouldn't even play games. So um, that's it. That's why I, I don't do it. So is why don't you want the bees to rob a failed hive? I want to inspect the hive first and then I want to make those resources available in a different spot because that hive where the bees died, I will probably be putting a new beehive there and a new colony of bees and I just want to get everything else out of there and then uh, let them clean it up. So, oh, here's another thing. When you ship bees, uh, where do I get my bees? Okay. In the past, because I've been using the uh, survivor line bees that are non-treated, uh, and this year I've treated with oxalic vaporization. In fact, in fact my uh, third cycle of treatment was this morning, even though rain's coming in. Um, I've been getting my stuff from Bee Weaver in Texas. So those are survivor bees. They're great. They're hygienic and all that stuff. There's another line of bees that came out called Saskatras bees and they come from Saskatchewan, Canada, and I've ordered a bunch of them. Now, this is a new experience for me with, I've always dealt with the Weaver family and they've been great. When I order bees from them, uh, they, they let you, in fact, when you order, you pick uh, weeks or you know, you know date zones that you wanna receive your bees. And of course, I buy in Queens a lot from them. And even locally, if, if you're buying packages, usually uh, nukes or packages, then uh, they'll tell you, well, they're going to be delivered, you know, the third week of May, second week of May, last week of April, whatever. And then you plan for receiving your bees. So these Saskatchewan bees uh, I bought from Man Lake. And this is my first uh, bee buying experience from Man Lake. I ordered packages from them. I ordered a bunch of them. They're expensive. And they include shipping. So, of course, uh, I contacted... 
Man Lake because I found out recently that I have to go out of town and do something for three days. And uh, so, well, you know, I want to make sure I've bought the bees. I paid for the packages. When do they come? So then I get a notice from, you know, Man Lake just verifying that I, that I purchased the bees, the packages will be shipped and, and all of that. And then I wrote them and I wanted to know, well, do you, do you have a week, for example, when I would know that they're going to be shipped? I might have to leave town. I want to make sure I'm here because those bees are going to be shipped to the post office. The post office is going to call me and then I'm going to zip out there and pick up my package bees. Uh, so, you know, can, is it the last week of April? Is it the first week of May? Can I, you know, request a week? What's going on? So I wrote to them. I got this email. Uh, yesterday afternoon. So this is kind of you know, buyer beware kind of situation. Man Lake is a huge company. And this is the response I got. Hi Fred, package B ship dates are not flexible. So I cannot guarantee any specific date that they may or may not ship out. I believe we're aiming to ship these bees out sometime next week, but do not have a firm date just yet. You'll receive an email confirmation with the date as soon as we have it set in stone. So when you are buying package bees from Man Lake, at least uh, the way this is described, they can't even give you a week that it's going to come. You are locked in. You have to stick around until those bees show up. I mean, today is April 19th. They won't even give me a, a specific week that they're going to show up. So I'm not super happy about that. I'm going to have a lot of money invested in bees and they're going to show up probably the minute I leave. Now, of course, what this prohibits is your ability to plan. You know, if I want to know when the bees are going to show up, at least give me a five day window, a, you know, a week window. But they can't forecast it. So they're just going to ship these out when they ship them. Basically, it says just like that. I cannot guarantee any specific date that they may or may not ship out. Every other company that I've bought bees from through the years has always given me the week that the bees are going to ship out. They always have. And they've given me that a month in advance. I realize there's weather extremes and, and changes and things like that, but I've never encountered anything like this. So I'm kind of stressed about Man Lake Bee Weaver. You know, of course, buying bees locally, you work something out and uh, there are a lot of bee clubs that get together and they do a, a bulk purchase, especially when bees are going interstate. They have to have permits and things like that. They know well in advance. Okay, well, you know, first week of May, everybody be here to get your bees kind of thing. And uh, I've never encountered anything like this where we can't tell you the week. We think maybe, we're not sure. So if you have any kind of travel schedule and if you need to get out of town to do other things and you're not always at your house uh, I don't know if you need to be buying from Man Lake they can't seem to pin down a week for you so it's frustrating for me because it's impossible for me to plan a travel schedule so but in the past I bought my bees from Bee Weaver and uh, I fly in Queens and then uh, that's easy. When you buy queens, you can ship them right in. But I'm looking forward to these Saskatras bees. I bought them from Man Lake. I have no clue when they're going to be here. I can't plan. I do have all my equipment staged. All the beehives are ready to go. I'm going to share it with you when we install them. But uh, that's a little frustrating for me. Uh, oh, and here's the best one. Larry Lee. How did your hives fare from the storm? For those of you who don't know, big storm came through on the 14th and uh, like I said I was out taking care of the hives I heard that the storm was coming in I went out and strapped down a bunch of hives my bees made it through I'm going to show video sequences of that here at the end in fact we're at the end so uh, as uh, the storm came in I expected hail I did not expect two inch hail I expected some wind I had not expect 70 mile an hour wind and uh, we got all of that. The whole uh, western side of my house is basically destroyed. So all the siding is smashed. Uh, the, the lights on the side of the doors are, are the glass is broken. The window to my art studio is broken. Uh, we got hammered. And uh, the beehives took uh, direct hits to the side and to their roofs. 
and a one beehive flipped over and uh, of course snow followed so it wasn't bad enough that we get this big hailstorm tornado hit the tornado didn't hit us but we had everything else even my weather station the anemometer which you know measures wind velocity uh, it snapped off the little cups on the anemometer so now it doesn't register the wind and you know if you'll notice in the video that i'm going to show as the close out here today i'm going to show the whole video sequence and then the aftermath stick around for that um, you could hear birds chirping and uh and you know nature was just doing its thing and the bees were out of course because it was a really warm day i think we hit like 70 degrees and uh, the bees were all flying and bringing pollen like crazy and uh, then uh, everything changed dramatically and the storm came in and the it looks like somebody took a shotgun and shot it at you know the yard everywhere because even the divots in the yard were heavy but uh, and it killed birds i couldn't believe it i found dead robins in particular on the ground that had just been nailed by hail so it was it was some intense stuff and guess what i didn't lose any bees the beehive that fell over that was hit by uh, the brunt of the wind and everything already had a dead out there were no dead bees i thought the bees had blown away from it but uh nope so the colonies that were alive before the storm are alive now and they made it and those physical the roofs uh, and everything else survived it so none of the roofs were were broken up all my solar panels if you don't know my house is 100 percent solar powered the solar panels are rated for golf ball size hail at 90 mile an hour direct impact, which is an incident angle of 90 degrees. So these were glancing impact. I have no cracked panels. They're all performing well. Uh, yeah, so the bees came through. But uh, I want to thank you for watching today. I want to wish you an, an excellent weekend. I hope you all avoided that storm that came through. It moved east. so. Uh, it was very strange for us, you know, th a few miles either side of us, north or south, and they just got light hail and some heavy, you know, rain and some wind. But that thing came right through my bee yard like it was targeted. And uh, so hopefully you've come through any of the bad weather that uh, might have happened. If you have questions for next week's Frequently Asked Questions About Bees, write them down in the comment section. We'll look those over and address them next Friday. And... Uh, I hope you have a great Easter weekend. Thanks for watching and uh, enjoy your peace.